pictures made by these men, we relive these last portentous 10 years. We see in perspective the weaving of the pattern of world fate. In these whirling ribbons of history, we see whole nations enslaved. We see the struggle of free peoples against a colossus of death. We see also the beginnings of the struggle. Thinking back to the last decade, it seems incredible that the story is true, that these pictures are fact and not fancy. Remember 1929? We live again in another world, a more hopeful world. Well, how'd you make out, Joe? Cleaned up. Cleaned up. Amalgamated up ten today. Yeah, I was in, too. Sent the little lady up for some new duds. <laughs> she'll spend her grand, but she'll look like a million. So you're free tonight, huh? What do you say to the folly? So, say, you know, the agents are only getting 50 apiece. Look, they got Norman Brokenshire announcing the celebs. And if it ain't, his honor himself. <laughs> Early for once. And here's Flo Ziegfeld. Ziggy. Yes, sir. His night to howl. Tex Guinan. And I'm I a sucker. Hiya, Tex. President Hoover is a newcomer in the White House. Prosperity rules throughout the land. There is no fear, for only yesterday our boys came back from over there, came back with democracy safe, with the Kaiser and his autocrats replaced with a German democracy, with the little nation safe through the Treaty of Versailles. Almost all civilized nations have parliamentary systems now. The world press is free and a free radio and free newsreels are counted upon to promote understanding and goodwill among the nations of the world. Abroad, nine great nations have signed the Brian Kellogg Peace Pact, forever abjuring war as an instrument of national policy. The Germans are celebrating the 10th anniversary of their new democracy, and the British are withdrawing their last forces from the bridgehead on the Rhine. There are, of course, certain clouds upon the international horizon. Bolshevism rules in Russia, where millions are on the edge of starvation under red rule. In Japan, the army group is in the ascendant, although the balance of power rests with a moderate government operating through the diet. But in Italy, there is an absolute dictatorship. Mussolini is inaugurating now a policy of teaching little boys how to be soldiers. By 1940, these little boys will be in their early 20s. But we in America can't do very much about Mussolini's policies. We teach our own youngsters that war is an evil thing, a dreadful cancer upon the human race, from which we tell our boys, America is safe. We pay less attention to affairs abroad after October 1929. For with the stock market collapse, our prosperity is now draining away. For millions of us, jobs vanish, and headlines from the old battlefields get scant attention. By 1930, the Valley of the Depression is worldwide. The British are in dire search for money and food. Their depression is worse even than ours. Germany pays little on her war debts. Her money is vanishing also and the leaders of her democracy are sorely troubled. Bloodshed comes first in Spain, the first conflict of the new decade. Hungry men revolt, running amok in the streets of a dozen Spanish cities. Soon King Alfonso realizes his day is done and flees his throne. Primo de Rivera assumes power. For a time, it seems he will become the strong man of Spain, another dictator in Europe. Here, with unemployment spreading, we still cling to our illusion of a world at peace, permanent peace. In 1931, we are reassured by visits from the peace-loving statesmen of Europe, Laval of France, whom we deluge with paper showers from those offices still open. And Grandi of Italy visits the White House. There, with President Hoover and Secretary of State Stimson, 
he beams into newsreel cameras with the announcement, Italy wants the peace and uh, understanding and uh, cooperation amongst uh, all nations uh, in the world. With Western nations in grave distress, the Japanese army acts. More bloodshed now, this time in Manchuria, without declaration of war. No heed by Japan to protests from Washington, from Washington alone. Aggression marches, and aggression sets an early example that does not pass unnoticed. 1932 finds the American democracy on the verge of deep panic. In Washington, there are demonstrations in front of the Capitol itself. Jobless veterans petitioning Congress for quick payment of the bonus set for 1945. Hungry men live in shacks fringing the broad avenues of Washington. And soon we are shocked as tanks roll down Pennsylvania Avenue and United States regulars march in battle formation, evicting the squatters. England is no better off. Her hunger marchers spread throughout the realm. In Germany, democracy is threatened by the communists who think the Russian idea will cure their troubles. And by a new and strange brown-shirted group believing in the Italian idea. Americans are reassured when the conservative von Hindenburg again triumphs in the elections, defeating the brown shirt leader Hitler. News from Italy is not so reassuring. Mussolini releases first pictures of his new air fleet, scouting planes and bombers, bombers and more bombers. children are growing up. Little shoulders that used to carry wooden guns now are carrying rifles that shoot real bullets. We Americans decide to try new remedies for our troubles. We turn to Franklin D. Roosevelt and the Democrats. President Hoover is defeated overwhelmingly. And with the election news, the cables from Shanghai begin to race with grim news of more Japanese aggression. The first great tide of the innocent who pay the price of war surges into the foreign concessions, and Japanese soldiers spread ruin and desolation throughout the native sections of China's commercial capital. The Kellogg Peace Pact has become another dishonored scrap of paper. It is significant to note that only eight years ago, the first Japanese assault on Shanghai was almost wholly by infantry. Mass bombing and machine gunning from planes had not yet become a commanding weapon of war. Inauguration Day in 1933 finds the American banking system shut down completely, and a new president captures the confidence of his nation with action. This nation is asking for action and action now. New banking laws are rushed through Congress, and the country unanimously falls into step, beginning the long, slow march toward renewed prosperity we so long for in this troubled year of 1933. Troubled indeed abroad, the now powerful Nazi party elects a scapegoat for the troubles of the fatherland. Jews once more become the special victims of general disaster. As the ancient Egyptians, in time of famine, turned upon their Jewish minority, so now do the fanatical brown shirts turn upon German Jews in a pogrom that horrifies the civilized democracies. And Hitler now preaches paganism, turns upon the great Protestant and Catholic churches, and at his command, brown shirts teach students to burn all books disliked by Hitler. The Dark Age returns to Germany and democracy dies when the Nazis burn the German parliament, the old Reichstag, blaming it on their enemies, the Reds. Americans continue to fight doggedly for restoration of economic safety. Chicago stages the greatest exposition the century has yet seen, 
and Americans applaud when the popular General Balbo leads a squadron of Italian battleships of the air on a goodwill visit to Chicago and New York. The significance of the flight is keenly noted abroad as well, but Americans pay little attention to a small item from Rome after Balbo's return. A German general named Goering visits Italy and spends much time with General Balbo, showing great interest in Italian air technique and Italian airplanes. Goering has no air force at home and throughout Germany has organized air clubs which study flying and learn piloting, beginning with fleets of gliders. Nineteen thirty-four brings to America new troubles. The great drought sets in. Windstorms carry off the powdery topsoil from huge areas in the panhandle. In many industrial sections, labor disputes grow into labor wars. And a weary public looks on as factories close down and relief rolls bound upward, bringing staggering totals of public indebtedness. The darkness over Europe spreads. Austria Chancellor Dolphus, would-be dictator, stamps out opposition with machine guns. Many die. Thousands lose their homes. In Germany, von Hindenburg passes. And in the panoply of his state funeral, the last of the old German Reich vanishes. There is now one will only in Germany, and a strident voice cries out to the world that the Treaty of Versailles is dead. In France, street barricades appear and rioting costs many lives. To some Americans, it seems that revolution is close at hand in France, but the government weathers the crisis. Conservative England is amazed at a fascist movement among her own people. Black shirts march through the streets of London, exercising their rights under the freedom of British democracy. To America, in 1935, comes other news that quickly dominates headlines. The Supreme Court upsets the NRA, by now already the subject of bitter disputes throughout industry. The struggle between the executive and judiciary begins. Abroad, Germany boldly announces rearmament. There are open maneuvers, and now instead of paper tanks, Germany has tanks of steel. Mussolini takes his cue, flouts the protective measures set up through the League of Nations to safeguard small nations, and boldly sets about the conquest of Ethiopia. Roma aveva Cesare, il figlio ed Augusto. Transport loaded a dozen Italian ports. And at Suez, steamed by the British battleships hastily stationed in the Mediterranean by an alarmed British government. Geneva applies sanctions, and the world soon learns how futile is the machinery of the League. Germany accepts national regimentation prescribed by the Nazis. Labor unions long ago have vanished, and compulsory labor battalions go about the tasks assigned in the Nazi program of military rebuilding. Under a plebiscite, the Nazis reclaim the great Saar Basin. And minorities flee the country before the wrath of the Nazis can overtake them. The 
purpose of Hitler now becomes plain to the eye. For now, all German cities regularly must practice air raid precautions, must learn precisely what to do when the time comes for them to flee enemy bombers. And throughout the Reich, concentration camps become the bitter home for all who displease the dictator, for clergymen who dare to defend their faith, for Jews who do not give up their all quickly enough, for priests and devout Roman Catholics who try to preserve their youth organizations. Things are somewhat better in the United States in 1936, and there is a new election impending. Franklin D. Roosevelt takes his new deal before the country and wins. American aeronautics are forging ahead in the ways of peace. Great clippers span the far Pacific and have regular, dependable schedules now to all of South America. America thrills, too, over the arrival of Britain's newest ocean liner, the Queen Mary, rival to the French Normandy. At home, the British lived through an astounding year. Three kings occupied the throne within 12 months. The beloved George V passes, with his oldest son, the Prince of Wales, walking behind his casket. In quick order, the prince takes the throne as Edward VIII and watches the ceremony with Mrs. Simpson and her husband. By December, the now famous romance with Wallace Warfield Simpson culminates in Edward's renunciation of his throne and in the accession of King George VI. From other capitals came news far more grave. Hitler reoccupies the Rhineland, set aside by the now extinct Treaty of Versailles as a safety belt against all future German aggression. France and England accept the situation, and the new policy of appeasing the man with the guns sets a new international tune. Civil war flares in Spain in a plot led by General Franco, seeking dictatorship and a fascist regime. Germany rushed to Franco's aid. Here is fine testing for Italian and German bombing planes. Madrid hangs on using subways as air raid shelters. And the government receives aid in some measure from Stalin. Women are mourning now throughout Spain, mourning not alone for husbands killed, but for babies dead in the testing of bombers. The ancient heritages of Spain are shattered. At dawn one grim morning, the Alcazar is blown to bits. Mussolini completes his conquest of Ethiopia, airplanes against tribesmen. His troops enter the capital, now in flames. The robed figure of Emperor Haile Selassie appears before the League of Nations in one last desperate appeal for the rights of small nations and meets the jeers of the Italian delegates. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le... Only one other scene in the 1936 record is so pregnant with deep meaning. The American president travels to South America for the Pan American Conference and there repeats the American ideal, the statement he has made in America with unanimous approval. I hate war.
The news of history runs in big type in 1937. Mussolini and Hitler meet in Berlin. And out of that meeting, faithful in its parade of uniforms and fascist salutes, comes news of the Rome-Berlin axis, now firmly cemented. Only Stalin remains alone, isolated now from democracies and from fellow dictators. In this, the democracies take comfort. But now in another treaty solemnized in Rome by Count Ciano, a third aggressor nation lines up with Europe's dictators. Japan joins a pact outwardly aimed against further spread of communism. In Tokyo, there is widespread rejoicing. Now, say the Japanese generals, it is our turn. Without too much attention to excuses, Japan again marches in China. Again, there is no declaration of war, but again, Chinese die by tens of thousands as their inadequate armies fall back before the well-armed Japanese. of aggression in Europe quickens. In 1938, Hitler marches, this time into Austria, after Mussolini has turned a deaf ear to the pleas of the Austrian Chancellor Schuschnigg. There is no fighting, for the Austrians are helpless in the grip of their own Nazi units. And the world learns for the first time Hitler's technique of the fifth column. The Czechs, thoroughly alarmed, mobilize. There is great clamor raised by the Germans over injustices they say have been inflicted upon German minorities in the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia. England rushes appeasement plans, and Americans, now fully awake to the dread significance of the European scene, follow every move of the British Prime Minister Chamberlain as he calls upon Hitler not once, but three times, ending with the Peace of Munich here, Czechoslovakia is partitioned. But Daladje returning to France and Chamberlain returning to England announce Hitler's solemn promise to go no farther. It looks like peace in our time, announces the happy British Prime Minister. This morning, I had another talk with the German Chancellor, Herr Hitler. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. Happy Mr. Chamberlain. Happy until March 1939, when Hitler breaks his word, sends his troops marching into ancient Prague, capital of the young Czechoslovakian Republic. Thus does Hitler begin his conquest of Europe, revealing, however, his own contempt for the rights of small nations. Americans now have little time for domestic news. In that bitter winter, a quarter million Spanish refugees had fled Barcelona, struggling over the Pyrenees in a preview of agonies to come. American sympathies are stirred, a greater apprehension begins to appear on the American scene. Roosevelt asks for huge new defense funds and gets them fast. The British are desperately working now on airplane manufacture, for at last the world knows that Goering has completed his secret plans 
and that Germany has five gigantic air fleets ready and waiting. Still, if only some form of friendship can be worked out with Russia, so the British argue, there may be time for them too to get ready for the inevitable. There is a happy interlude for America, where the King and Queen of England visit Canada and the United States. Perhaps, Americans argue, the British really are confident of peace, or how else would they permit this visit? Confidence mounts a trifle. Perhaps there won't be war after all. And then, in August, the bombshell, this time from Moscow. Incredibly, Stalin and Hitler join hands. The arch enemies of old become fellow aggressors, and von Ribbentrop flies back to Berlin with the news that the way is now clear. There are futile gestures now, notes to Berlin from London, receiving scant attention from Hitler. For the German mind is now on other plans, plans that mature into action on September 3rd, 1939. And the war is on. War. At dawn, off go the bombers, formation upon formation, following exactly the long planned schedule. These pictures are the work of the German Army Photographic Corps, and many of these scenes are destined to be incorporated in the long-length versions edited in Berlin and used in Norway, Holland, and Belgium, and Romania in the now famous psychological campaign of fright. advance guard is motorized. These columns lead the way for 1,700,000 German troops. Tanks follow closely. In these pictures, the Germans reveal for the first time the strength of their tank division, most of them built since 1936. Wreckage is everywhere. It is a revealing fact that the German censors permit no pictures of the wounded, no pictures of the dead. Scene upon scene, the film hammers home the picture of a mighty army and forgets completely misery and broken homes and broken bodies. The first complete fifth column victory is in Danzig, the same Danzig that voted against alliance with Germany in 1935 and then, four years later, with Germany rearmed, changed its mind. The first naval action of the war takes place in the bombardment of Poland's Westerplatte munitions stronghold, where 120 suicide squad Polish soldiers hold out six days against bombardments from land, air, and sea. These are German-made pictures of the warship Schleswig-Holstein in action during the bombardment. Warsaw, a Paramount News American cameraman records the reverse of the German-made pictures. These are the scenes of a people not yet aware of the full deadliness of the enemy planes overhead. They run, 
but stand to look. They are more curious than apprehensive so far. But too soon they learn, with their home shattered by bombs, with their families and their children the targets. Within 18 days, there is no more Poland. There is only the food given out by enemy bread lines and only the all-powerful rules of the enemy Gestapo. You shall not assemble, you will do no talking, you will tune your radios only to German stations on penalty of death. You will obey all laws we lay down and ask no questions. Freedom is dead in Poland. The Soviet now takes the stage. With the Baltic states garrisoned with Russian troops and destined soon for total absorption, Finland stands her ground. America thrills to news of their stand, to news that tells of a fighting race of free men taking on odds of 10 to 1, and time and again breaking the massed advance of the Soviet mechanized troops. The ghost-like ski fighters take the first page in all the free press of the world, and Stalin finds himself stalemated for a month. But soon he unleashes the full fury of air attacks. His squadrons trace a deadly pattern in the frozen skies over Finland. The Finns endure. Their Mannerheim line holds until, with odds mounting against them until 50 Russians are facing one Finn, there comes the inevitable breakthrough. Stalin takes breath and accepts a compromise peace, leaving Finland still independent, still a land of democratic principles. But for how long, the world can only guess. The quiet war sets in, the war of nerves. Radios bear the war of propaganda to all countries, especially to the little countries standing in the path. Three times Holland mobilizes. Three times her queen gives the word, all clear. The Scandinavian rulers have met, seeking some way out, and have found no solution. There is action only on the sea. America finds the war on her doorstep with the burning of the German liner Columbus, destroyed when her dash for safety is intercepted at sea by a British destroyer. The Germans burn her themselves and leave her to sink. Guns echo on South American coasts as the Graf Spee, trapped by British cruisers, meets her fate. Outfought by ships of lesser gun power, she lies in Montevideo Harbor, battered and shell-torn. Take her out and scuttle her, comes the order from Berlin. On the mud flats beyond the harbor, the orders are obeyed. And Germany's $19 million cruiser, finished only in 1936, becomes a tangled heap of scrap iron. In April, the Germans swarm into Denmark. There is no fighting, for the Danes are too few, too weak to offer resistance. And then, Norway. The capital, Oslo, is paralyzed with the suddenness of the invasion. These films, made by a Paramount newsman and rushed to Sweden before the Germans could set up censorship, record an almost incredible happening. Casually, with bands playing Roll Out the Barrow, the German columns march to predetermined posts. There is an occasional glimpse of civilians with the Nazis' fifth column. And throughout the parks of Oslo, many families take their daily airing in the bright spring sunshine. But in the back country of Norway, there is a different kind of story. Arthur Mencken, Paramount News cameraman, goes in from Sweden and tells what he saw and what his camera recorded. Once in Norway, I ran into successive sentry posts. These men were Norwegian regulars. They accepted my credentials on the spot, and that very fact showed how disorganized the Norwegian forces were. Not once was I escorted to any type of field headquarters. The Germans were pushing up from Oslo, refugees ahead of them. Volunteer companies were lining up in all the villages. A kid lieutenant, maybe 22, was trying to organize this outfit. Militiamen who hadn't had time to reach mobilization points. Another officer actually was trying to teach men how to use firearms, how to aim a rifle or pistol. At such a time, with organized crack Nazi troops marching at them, some were beginning to train. Women, too, were volunteering for nursing, trying to join the Lethas, the Norwegian Girls Auxiliary Corps. We went to a ridge overlooking the town, for there were Nazi planes all over the sky. 
Officers broke up the columns, ordered the boys into the woods. Scatter, take cover, get out of sight. I filmed them as we ran. Watch the faces. Now came the raid. The Nazi pilots well knew we had no anti-aircraft guns. They came at the town flying wickedly low. They couldn't miss. Machine guns against bombers. tried any longer to put out the fires. Their homes were doomed, and they knew it. Just a little town, Reyna, something like Milford, Pennsylvania, Ellsworth, Maine. When I pressed on back to Stockholm, where I knew I could get these pictures developed without censorship, there was nothing left of Reyna. The pictures I made of the Nazi bombers will, I believe, constitute absolute proof of a deliberate attack on an undefended open town. I saw it happen. And this is the record. In England, transports load with the few troops available, territorials for the most part, who bring with them light artillery and no anti-aircraft guns. There is great public clamor as they sail. Can England stop the German invasion? But the inevitable happens, and again the camera of Arthur Mencken records the failure of brave men, inadequately equipped, against veteran troops using modern weapons in plenty, and according to plans, worked out to the last detail. The British retreat from Norway, and the story of that retreat is graphically told by Mencken. As a war correspondent, I covered Spain. I filmed the bombings of Shanghai and Nanking. I saw large parts of Helsinki and Vipery blown out of existence. But nothing I have seen in Spain, in China, or in Finland, had one-tenth the shattering effect of that trip back from Norway. Fires, possibly abandoned supplies, lit the fjord as night came. I had permission to sail back to England in the convoy, but there was not much light for embarkation pictures. By dawn's gray light, we moved along the silent waters of Namsus Fjord. From every hidden cove came ships to join our own, and when all had fallen in line, the convoy pointed out to sea. Here we were in narrow, confined waters, easy targets for bombers. And there were German planes in these skies. Anything might happen. The heavy-laden French and British transports had expeditionary equipment hastily piled on every deck. This was the end of Norway for this contingent and for many more. And then it came, the familiar drone of Nazi dive bombers. signals whipped out and coming up were aircraft carriers. This one seemed to be the Ark Royal, long before reported sunk in German communiques. Escort destroyers were rushing up too, but the raid was over. Not a single ship had been hit, and anti-aircraft fire had done its job, I thought. Dinner was served out, and if anything ever came at just the right time, that chow was it. It was so calm and peaceful now that the raid seemed like a bad dream. One Tommy was relaxing with a haircut. Nearby, an English army chaplain discussed the raid with the French Navy's padre. And a batch of German prisoners seemed to be unworried passengers as we steamed along.
lookouts were at every hand. I had seen those Blitzkrieg air attacks before, and I thought the first one was just a sample. I had my camera loaded, and pretty soon we heard them. sounded suddenly, and what seemed an awful silence cloaked the still hot guns. British fighter planes had done their part in that wild melee. Back aboard their carrier, they reported casualties. On the convoy's far flank, the British destroyer Alfredi and the French bison had gone under after bomb hits. Our flag was half-masted in tribute. We seem beyond further raids as we plunged into the roughening sea. Planes against ships. I have my own answer to that. I've got the pictures, and I've got my memories of skies that rain down hell. Now, day by day, fear sets a cold grip upon Holland and Belgium. They cling to their precarious neutrality, declare they will fight if invaded by any nation. They say they dare not let the French and British troops come in. Perhaps, they argue, the Germans, seeing them completely neutral, will not attack. The answer soon comes. Blitzkrieg upon the Low Countries. forces hurriedly flung to the rescue again find retreat imperative. There was no time to prepare, and now the wounded must be got out, somehow, anyhow, through the storm of death from the sky. With Holland gone, the Belgians look to France, and with their enemy on the march, they attempt full mobilization. Paris, and goodbye. Belgian men board special trains to rush to their invaded country. Answer King Leopold's call to help stem the German blitzkrieg. And as the war torch set flames across the Low Countries, these few farewells were just a passing incident in a Europe where farewell to life is being written for thousands in history's greatest battle. On the French northern front, a farewell in steel. Mechanical monsters by the thousands mobilized to advance against the German thrust. 3,000 tanks reported in one single clash. Artillery in staggering quantities for a war gone real. Again, the inevitable. All villages, towns, and cities in Belgium fall victim to the blood bath from the sky. The pictures need no explanation, but the mind's eye must multiply each picture a thousand times for these same tragedies are inflicted throughout all Belgium. Two million people, old people, women, girls, children, take to the road, hasten toward France. Hastening, they think, toward safety. Today, no man knows how many still live. But always, the memory lives, memories vivid to the old. They fled then as they do now, but with great difference. 26 years ago, they had a chance of escaping. No planes then for machine gunning refugees. In Brussels, now fallen to the Nazis, the first days of the great battle see the streets filled with soldiers and noisy with the rumble of artillery on the move. These pictures reflect the hope that filled the Belgian capital, the hope that failed. The 
grim business that lay ahead of the Belgian army is slowly emerging day by day through the fog of war. As in 1914, they faced disheartening retreat. Their morale then upheld by the leadership of the late King Albert. Today, again, retreat became imperative, but with another ending becoming more clearly their fate under King Albert's son. Allied troop concentration hampered by refugees, the battling regiments of the French and British report frequently, as repeated daily in the communiques, that refugees hamper their movements. To the Nazis, the dispossessed population means nothing. To soldiers of the Allies, they mean helpless people to consume food, to take up room on the roads to slow down movements of armies. Defenseless towns set afire by incendiary bombs. And here is the reason for the refugees, the utter destruction of a typical French town, not fortified, simply a place where people live. The camera records an incendiary raid from beginning to end. There is no need for words. Belgium surrenders. A million men are pocketed, hopelessly trapped. The bulletins shock the world. And then the electrifying flash, the British are succeeding in getting their army out of Dunkirk. With every airplane available, with every gun within range, the Nazis endeavor to make Dunkirk a living hell, to close off the one avenue of escape remaining open to the encircled armies. The bombs reduce the port facilities to wreckage. No dock remains to accommodate even the smallest vessel. The harbor is a shambles. Yet, out of this shambles, in certainly the greatest outstanding naval achievement of the war, the British rescue a third of a million men, five out of every six men who had fought in the campaign of Flanders. Led by destroyers, an armada of small vessels comes to the rescue. The British Admiralty estimates there were 850 small crafts working day and night for almost 10 days. A shuttle of little boats ferrying a host of men across the channel. Exhausted men, these. Dog-weary Tommies and sailors who snatch an hour or two of sleep and carry on. Every hour finds the docks of a dozen English ports receiving rescued soilers. With the British are many French, Poilus who do not know yet the news from France who do not know that the letters they write home stand little chance of delivery. Every hour, bombardment of Dunkirk is intensified. The actors in the drama have no time, except for the imperative demand of the job of the moment. Fill the boats, bring them out. And as the American Admiral Farragut once said, damn the torpedoes. Only for the wounded is there time to spare time to make sure that all reach safety. And there are many wounded, for the fighting in Flanders has been cruelly vicious. And so the order passes to the last remaining 70,000. Take to the beaches, wade out, swim out. We'll get the small boats in for you. And so the men wade out, carrying often the company pets, the friends they wouldn't leave behind. The survivors of Dunkirk's rear guard come home. Men who dumbfounded military experts by accomplishing the technically impossible. Men who defeated the Nazi trap. Across the channel, Nazis strike at the heart of France, Paris. News of intensive bombing foretells the end. 
For now, the horror that has crowded Paris with refugees from northern France falls upon Paris herself. As the fires burn in the streets of the capital, the news from the front ends all hope. The French army has broken and is in disordered retreat. Incredible retreat, incredible rout, incredible defeat. Where are the legions now that were the pride of all France? The mightiest army in the world. Where now the Maginot Line, that guarantee of safety into which France had poured millions upon millions of francs? Where now the leaders of yesterday, Blum of the Front Populaire and Erio? And the sit-down strikers who slowed down plane production. Where now, France? That news, Italy comes into the war. Mussolini seizes his moment and joins his Axis partner Hitler to strike at fallen France and at Britain in the Mediterranean basin. The children of 1930 are on the march with real guns that shoot real bullets. Two million Italians are under arms. The long-expected die is cast. Guns thunder over the Mediterranean. And the Italians find that British guns shoot straight and hard. These pictures made by Italian photographers aboard record the first running fight with the British. Their fleet out of sight below the horizon. But their shells coming close as the camera reveals. cover under a smoke screen, turning to escape the British bracket of fire now over the Italian line of battle. After the battle, crews on the Italian ship fight the fire started by British shells. One turret and more than one secondary battery are clearly out of action. The British work night and day, turning the United Kingdom into one gigantic fortress. The insistent demand of the British public for action brings into power Winston Churchill, man of action. Under the whiplash of his energy, British workmen labored 10 and 12 hours a day, seven days a week, willingly and gladly. Work or die, he tells them. Debating stops, and everywhere, every man and every woman does the assigned job. Open fields that might invite enemy transport planes to land are studded with heavy poles, a new defensive device. Everywhere, emergency barricades are erected at crossroads, designed to delay invading forces should they ever succeed in landing. Every man who can shoulder a gun drills so that he may serve in the Parachute Home Defense Corps against the day promised by Hitler when parachute troops are to land by thousands and tens of thousands over all of the kingdom, perhaps. First from the air comes the attack, designed to destroy English shipping, to make the English Channel a German ditch. British shipping goes on its way, and day by day, hordes of Nazi planes attack, and scenes such as these become commonplace.
stands from the sky grim evidence of British fighting fury. Nazi airmen bailing out of planes shot down. Sometimes the parachutes burn and the pilot dies. And now the Nazi flights of death come over London. Home of eight million. London, heart of the British Empire. London, treasure house of the century. The British fight back savagely, relentlessly, with heroism that commands new respect for British manhood. The toll is heavy. The price of resistance is high. But, say the British, this we pay now, and many times this we will pay, to ensure our freedom and our ultimate victory. The British are heartened by inspiring news from America. Fifty destroyers are added to their fleet. The speedy American fighting ships are delivered to Canadian harbors. They are manned by British and Canadian crews and rush to join the fleet defending the British Isles. By the now famous British-American compact, Britain gives the United States air and naval bases in British North American territory from Newfoundland to the tropics. With the Blitzkrieg in full swing, Americans read and hear daily questions that deeply affect the fate of these United States. Can Britain hold out? If Britain falls, what will be the fate of the British Navy? Will Hitler and company dare consider an attack upon the United States once we are fully armed? While we still are weak, can Hitler's fifth column in America create enough dissension to slow us down sufficiently for Hitler's purposes? Hitler does not believe in America. Publicly, he scoffs at America as a land of degenerate Yankeedom. But perhaps Hitler does not know America does not realize that a free people knowing the truth through their free press can weigh the facts and reach a free and independent judgment. Perhaps Hitler does not realize that his idea of life has been condemned at the judgment bar of American opinion. Hitler decrees that only the mighty shall have the right to think. Small nations must bow the knee to their powerful neighbors. Hitler cannot understand why America, so vast, so powerful, should grant freedom to Cuba. Why America should pour millions into the Philippines, educate her people, and then set them free. Hitler sneers at America the good neighbor. To him, the Brotherhood of Nations, as exemplified by the Havana Conference, is nonsense. To him, the idea of the United States sitting in friendly conference with the South American republics is silly. But Americans understand why. They know why they want free speech, with opposition always free to demand power if the people wish to give that power. Americans understand also why they will not teach their children to burn books, to turn their backs upon the truth, but rather to use books and find out the truth in free school. Americans of all faiths understand why every man must be free to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience and not according to the hatreds of a dictator. Americans also understand the dictators themselves, these men who make clear that might shall be right, that armed force shall dictate an economic conquest of the world. And to these dictators, through the Congress and of their own will, the American people have now declared, for every plane you have, we shall have 10, so that not one of your bombers shall ever dare fly over American homes. For every gun you have, we shall have 10, so that you may think twice before any challenge to us. For every fleet you have, we shall have two, so that we shall command not one ocean, but the Atlantic and the Pacific both, to meet any threat from the east or from the west. Not for aggression, not for war, 
but for the assurance of peace. America sets out to become the mightiest force the world has ever known. To the end that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Amen.